It's Lucy Litch, and this is Tiny House Conversations. It's the Australian-based podcast where I interview experienced tiny houses, tiny builders, and adventurers in the tiny world, so you can discover how to create, build, and transition into tiny life. Welcome back to Tiny House Conversations. Joining me on the show today is Riley Skeen, who's the Managing Director of Treehab Tiny Houses. Over the past five years, they've helped many Australians realise their tiny house dream. They work hard to ensure your tiny house is built to the highest standards and provides you with a safe, secure foundation to live your tiny dream. They're passionate about design, innovation, and most importantly, sustainability. And in this conversation, we talk about what makes Treehab unique and how they approach innovation, sustainability, and environmentally sound practices, the shift from Airbnb to long-term living with tiny homes. We also talked about the different demographics that they build tiny homes for, Treehab's tiny house models, their tiny home kits for DIYers, and how they customize their off-grid solutions according to your needs, and lots more. It was really great to chat with Riley and get to know a bit more about him and Treehab. So on to this tiny house conversation with Riley. Hey, Riley, welcome to Tiny House Conversations. It's so good to have you on the show today. Thank you for having me. This is great. So I was saying to you before we started recording that I'd heard about you guys, Treehab Tiny Houses, for many years now. And uh, it's, you know, been great to get you on the show just to find out a bit more about what you guys do and what you're up to this year. But before we dive into all of that, I'd love to hear a little bit about your background. How did you get into even building tiny homes and how long have you guys been doing that for? Yeah, well, it's a, it's an interesting question, Lucy. So we started the business back in early 2019. Um, we did a lot of research during 2018. We never, ever intended to be building and selling tiny homes. It was pretty much completely by accident. I guess that's that's how things things evolve. We come from our family, so it's a family business. Um, I'm the managing director. We have farms out in Western Victoria. Come from actually come from a farming background, dairy mainly, uh, and we had all these amazing sites on the farms where we thought we've got to do something with it. What are we going to do? So we were originally thinking cabins. We had never, you know, tiny homes were were big in America before they were big here. And we thought we'd build some cabins. Went around looking for someone to build them and we couldn't find anyone to build them. So we thought (laughs) that uh, we would give it a go ourselves. We partnered with a a builder and, uh, again, never intended to, to build and sell tiny homes Ended up because of the area, the overlays, all that sort of thing. Um, the council said, if you build it on a trailer as a caravan, we'll let you basically have it without a building permit. I thought, great. So um, that sort of that's how it evolved into being a tiny home on wheels and and following the Australian design rules and all those sort of things to make sure that we were compliant as a vehicle and could be moved on the road safely. And then posted it on Facebook yeah, early 2019 and someone walked into the little factory that we had, uh, which is only a block away from where we are now um, in Chelmsford Street in Williamstown North and offered to buy it. And we went, oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> and uh, it's thought, all right, sold it, built another one, so on, so on, so on. And now this is our sixth year of actual building and selling. And it's evolved into into quite a decent sized business by by itself. And beginning of COVID, uh, which was 2020, we finally got around to building our own house for uh, the farm. <laughs> and uh, COVID sort of just call it get in the way. It was it was it was a great. We were getting probably a booking a week, um, which was a good case study for our Airbnb customers, um, which was a large percentage of what we were doing back then. And then it just, unfortunately, with COVID, open, close, open, close, open, close, we just decided to to sell it and we have never got around to doing it since. So that's that's pretty much how we ended up doing what we're doing. We're in our third factory now with growth has been, growth has been massive. We're looking to expand again this year to another premises. Um, as I was talking with you before earlier, we've had a lot of new people start 
this year. So that's been amazing. The team's growing. We're growing. Yeah, it's it's all going in the right direction. Wow. I love that story. I love how you uh, had, I guess, you know, talking about business and all of that is like solving a problem and you couldn't find someone to solve that problem for you. So you created that opportunity for yourself and kind of now look what's happened over the years. I love that. Uh, I'm, I'm imagining how really good it must have felt when you built that first tiny home and someone wanted to buy it. And you're like, did you feel like, oh, oh maybe there's something here? The first one, probably not so much. The second one, I was like, oh, wow, because they were so close together. It was like we built a yeah. little six metre. We called it all of our um, tiny homes are, are named after native trees and plants and that sort of thing. So um, we've got the wattle, the tea tree, the red gum, the banks here, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the wattle, not to confuse it, was now the tea tree. The first one we did was a, was a six metre tea tree sold that, built a red gum. Um, Red gum is a very basic single level sort of, uh, sorry, single loft design. And um, it was just really basic, but it had everything that people needed, you know, to live in. Like it had a good size living space for a tiny home. Um, You could have a TV, a space for a TV, a decent size kitchen, like a three meter long bench with nine function oven, cooktop, range hood, yeah, you know, everything you needed, everything that most residential three bedroom, two bathroom houses have in a kitchen, it had, as well as a 1200 by 800 shower, which is quite popular these days. Back when we started, though, most people were actually buying them for Airbnb and, and, the, and the rental market. Whereas today, the last 12 months, we've sold one house as an Airbnb. So it's wow. all moved towards full-time living. As you said, it's really solving a big problem that our country has. Um, hopefully, we're, I, think, I think we're moving in the right direction. I don't think we're moving in the wrong direction. I think people are, especially here in Victoria, are taking on board tiny house living in a positive way. And I think so many other states and councils hopefully will follow but we, we're yet to see what, what happens. Yeah, and I, I was going to ask you about that actually because I know that it seems to be a common story, especially in the last 12 months, maybe even two years, that there was this move away from all this Airbnb and there's much more long-term living, just speaking to other builders too. And it's been interesting to observe that shift over the years because I think I might have come across you guys initially at one of the tiny homes expos a few years back and I do remember because I was at the expo speaking to lots of different people I was I think I was with Bryony from Park My Tiny House and helping her out at her stand and just talking to a lot of different people there were actually so many Airbnb people are looking at tiny houses for the purpose of Airbnb and there was still long-term living but not as much now um reflecting and and hearing and speaking to people, as you say, uh, and even just observing what's going on online in Tiny House Facebook groups and people asking questions about, you know, how how do I start or, you know, what's the best builder and all of this because I I want it for my family or myself or me and my partner for long term. Uh, It's actually, I think, a really heartening thing to see because it is in this reality of a housing crisis where some people and it you know breaks my heart some people are living in their car or on the street or in camping grounds and you even see that with small children and families it's like this is a serious solution it might not be the only one or the thing but it's a very big part of it and uh, if it means that you can have a structurally sound vehicle that's not really anything like a caravan, even though you know people like to think that it is. And the whole trailer park vibe, it, it's it's built with structurally sound materials, as you know, like a regular home. If we can get people into small versions of this, like there's a real opportunity here to sort of change things for people in, in all the ways. So I, I agree with you. I think that, um, you know, you're heading in a, a really good direction as well. And uh, part of what I, I find interesting and unique about you guys is you talk about on your website, um, you know, that you're passionate about innovation, but also sustainability and environmentally sound practices and things like that. So I'm wondering if you're able to share with us just a little bit about how Treehab navigates that, how do you approach that and put that into practice? Yeah, so 
Um, there's a couple of things that that we're sort of, you could say, known for in the industry. And, and one of the big ones is steel framing. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Um, mm -hmm. I can tell you now, when you're building on a trailer, weight is obviously one of your biggest concerns, um, biggest issues. If you're overweight, you're, you're not insurable. Um, not only not insurable, it's, it's quite dangerous to all those around it when, when it's being moved. Four and a half ton electric brakes are um, restricted to four and a half ton in Australia. It doesn't matter if the trailer can take six ton, eight ton, ten ton. Um, if they've got electric brakes, that's the limit. Doesn't matter if it's one, two, three, four, five axles. That is the limit. It would be amazing if it was six ton. In America, you can get away with six ton electric brakes. So making sure that if you're going to build on an electric brake trailer, you're underweight. So steel is 50% lighter than timber construction. So when the frame is one of your largest structural elements, making sure that it is not only strong termite proof, because here in Australia, who knows where tiny home could end up long term, and a lot stronger as well. So all of our tiny homes actually come with an engineer's certification. Um, so you know that you're getting a house that is going to last. It is it is built, it is checked by multiple people is so important. So um, the steel framing is also 100% recycled as well. So it's not only is it stronger, straighter um, and engineered, it is actually recycled. Uh, we also use a product called Green Stuff with one, it's Green Stuff with 1F insulation. It's recycled PET plastic bottles. So it is more, it's more expensive than traditional fiberglass insulation, but it is sustainable. Uh, it's acoustic rated as well. So when you close the doors of a treehab dining house, if it's next to a three-way, you can't hear anything. <laughs> um, it's completely Amazing. insulated. Um, and acoustic. Um, going back to what you were saying, though, about how you know a lot more people are living in tiny homes now, we have just introduced a line of air braked trailers. So we don't. So they're ten ton rated trailers. So the traditional four and a half ton, which electric braked, is what most people know tiny homes and 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 the like to to be restricted by. These trailers. We can pretty much, within reason, obviously weight distribution is still a key factor. Having 40% of the weight forward, I'm uh, sorry, 60% forward of the middle axle, 40% to the rear or thereabouts, that, that's the safe balance for, for transport. But these trailers, they come in at about two and a half ton empty. So we have about seven and a half ton um, to play with. So material is not as big a concern, still important. Um, on what material we pick because of movement and all those sort of things. But we will be, we haven't officially announced it on social media yet. So this is, you could say, sort of the announcement. But um, okay. we've got one in the factory right now, 11 by 2.5. So that extra, uh, most of our, our standard designs are all 8.4, except for our tea tree. We do a couple of smaller ones. But an extra, um, that extra 2.6 metres of space just in in a tiny home um it sounds ironic because tiny homes are getting bigger but uh when you're living in it you got an extra 2.6 meters of space in, in your living room that makes a huge difference like massive difference we're we're getting families now that you know have seven hundred thousand dollar mortgages that sell their house release the equity in their house buy a, a, a between a hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollar tiny house and live completely debt free, lease land or have families land or however it works, or buy land and live on on in the country or we've we've done we've done tiny homes now on residential blocks in the city. Um that, oh, really okay. yeah, yeah. So it's uh, Victoria, luckily enough, is is going in the right direction. We've had Surf Coast Shire, which is like Anglesey down. Yeah. Geelong region, be really, really supportive of tiny homes as well as Mount Alexander Shire, which is up Castle Main region. They're pretty much the two in Victoria that were the early adopters of tiny homes. Um, we're bang in the middle of the two shires. Oh, amazing. So we've been building lots of tiny homes. It's good that the locals have been taking it up as well. Not only has the council said that 
they're supportive. The locals have jumped on board and and there's there's tiny homes everywhere. That's great. Well, I think that uh, you know, with the those two shires in Victoria as well as one in WA, and then I think there's one in Queensland as well. Just from speaking to lots of different landowners that have spare space, but are sort of, it, I mean, everyone's gonna everyone's gonna be comfortable with different things. Some people are like, look, I want to go the route of doing the right thing and liaising with council, or or what's council going to think of this? And other people are like, I don't care. Like by the time we wait for council to catch up yeah. um, in our specific area, you know, in the meantime, there's um, people that could be helped with a roof over their heads. Yeah. But I, I have seen that when a council comes to the party, like these two in Victoria that you're talking about, it does provide that peace of mind to people that maybe they don't have to look over their shoulder or worry one day that the council is going to come knocking on their door or, you know, have a tiny house person moved along or just give any, just give them a bit of a hard time or however that looks like. So I'm hoping, I feel very hopeful that there's going to be more councils coming on board as they sort of start to see, uh, you know, that this being taken up in other parts of the country and also that they have such a big opportunity now to work with tiny house builders just like yourself mm. to provide these solutions. It would be in the best interest of everyone really because then they're not going to have to deal with all this home homeless stuff yeah. and people um, living under the radar and, you know, things like like that and when and then when you have I suppose you're talking about it sort of more in suburban areas but I think for the most part people are living in rural properties and then that brings in in Australia you know we do have bushfire risks in many part of the countries and then if people are living under the radar there's that whole thing going on of like well if they're not there and you know we can't provide them resources and you know flooding and all sorts of things so I think in in overall it's like more councils coming to the this party would be just beneficial for everyone. So it's it's really great to know because uh, I actually haven't heard that before um, in terms of tiny houses all over those two shires. Like I know there's more uptake and all of that, but it's great to see that you guys are helping with that and building the homes down that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And and I can't say too much yet, but we are working with a lot of other councils as well. The main sort of issue that we've come across over the years, and not not so much the last 12 months, but, but prior to that, is what is a tiny house? Is a tiny yeah. house a caravan? Is a tiny house a load on top of a trailer? Is a tiny house a, a skid cabin? What is it? They all meet a different classification. I think it all gets grouped into one, one classification in the council's eyes. Um, so when yeah. people have called up the council and, and said, They've said, no, I can't put a tiny home on the block. Um, well, did you ask them what they actually think a tiny home is? And nine out of ten times they think a tiny house is a concrete pad, you know, yeah. a 60 square metre, two-bedroom sort of sort of house being actually built. And that's why they go, you need a building permit. It's going to drag out the process, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the beauty of the tiny homes that we build and, and most of the other people that you talk to do is that it's faster, um, it's easily movable, it's cheaper most 99% of the time. And, yeah, it's something that that if you don't own the land, you own the house. So you can take it with you wherever you go. Uh, we have several exactly. customers that move regularly. Uh, we have a lot of customers that buy here, live in it for a while and decide they're going to move to Queensland and retire in Queensland. And they can't take the land with them, but they can take the house. People weren't able to do that before, you know, many years ago, right? It's like if you if you're in a home, you kind of are restricted to one spot, and then you've got to move all your stuff. And look, if you do relocate with a tiny home, you still kind of have to do that. But it's in a you, you weren't able to take your home with you before, so I think that opens up a lot of uh, opportunities for people to to just create a really unique way of living and know that uh, you know there's flexibility and yeah, you know, it can come at a cost of having to move and all of that with towing and whatever but I think it's still it's there's something really cool about knowing like even myself I live in a tiny home like if I want to move at some point because my situation changes like I can take you know my home with me but at the same time it's also an asset in it that could be part of a family you know or it could provide housing for someone else in the family if you want to live on the same piece of land or in someone's backyard or something like that for as multi-generational living Maybe an extension if there's kids or 
teenagers or whatever it might be, there's actually so many different options that uh, you can use them for. And, and I'm curious just on that note, like are you finding that people, uh, you know, we're talking about before with more long-term living now, are you finding different people are using it for different purposes as well as diff- different demographics coming to you? Uh, because I feel like there's so many more people that are looking towards this way. Like once upon a time it was mostly people that are thinking about, oh, I want to, you know, less impact on the earth, I want to live on the land. And there's still obviously people, know, you know, that's a big part of it and the financial thing. But there seems to be, like I'm seeing people that are going through divorces or maybe they're looking in t- to retire or, uh, you know, expanding families and all sorts of, of uses um, and demographics. So what, what is it that you guys are seeing maybe in the last year especially? Yeah, it's, good. it's a good question because I, I get asked a lot, like, what, what's your target market? What's your demographic? And and it is so broad. It is it is yeah. based for the kids, full-time living, retirees, young people want to stay on the farm. We've got, we got one in the factory at the moment. It's a, um 18-year-old's birthday present. So she doesn't know she's getting oh, it. Oh, wow. Um, <gasps> and it's purely so that, the, you know, they live out in the country so they can keep her yeah. on the farm sort of thing. Wow. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'd love to be adopted by that family. Uh, yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, look, we've got um, a house in there where elderly mother lives by herself. So the daughter has bought the tiny house to put in the backyard so she can look after her mum. Um, we've done people in rural areas that uh, it it takes them a long time to renovate their house just because the builders are in such demand. Uh, might be three to five years. They don't want to leave their farm, but their house is so run down. So they buy a tiny home. They can live next to the house while it's getting renovated. There's so many different things they can be used for. Tourism, of course, as we touched on earlier. Uh, but the last 12 months has been predominantly, you could say, single people retiring that want to sort of yeah, you could get out of the city and settle down, basically. Excuse me, somewhere a little bit quieter. Is yeah. it's, it's predominantly living in, yeah. Yeah, and I guess downsizing too and sort of just realising I don't even need like all this space anymore mm. for one person or I don't need all this stuff anymore for one person. So like a tiny house just makes sense for a lot of people. I, I love hearing that. And you, you mentioned before as well about your uh, homes being named after native trees and you mentioned, you know, all the different names. Do you want to let us know a bit more about each of the models or anything that you'd like to share? So I know you said that and it's very true, tiny houses are getting a lot bigger than they were before. I think often before it was like 6 metre and 7.2 metre, but now seeing so many more 8.4 and even up to like 9 or 9.6. So, yeah, whatever you'd like to share about the models that you guys have on offer. Yeah, so we've got four models. We do a couple of them in different sizes. Um, So our tea tree design, which is just your very simple single level queen bed, basic kitchen no oven it's just sort of it's sort of your airbnb or short stay model we call that we do that a five a six and a seven meter design so that sort of was the original one that we we built early on as an airbnb we then built the red gum which is just our single loft good size living space when i was telling you before that it's got like a good size kitchen for a tiny home it's got everything you need to live in but it stairs to a loft so Most people will uh, live in that. Uh, We then have our Banksia. So our Banksia was our third sort of design, end of 2019, early 2020. It was originally a seven-metre design. It very quickly became an 8.4, and it's a double loft with a downstairs bedroom. So if you really want to, you can sleep up to six people. Um, It's got a queen bed at the front loft, king at the rear, and a double or queen walk around downstairs with a full wardrobe. And then we do that design in a single level only. So it is marginally cheaper if you don't need the two lofts. You still have a little storage loft in the single level. But that that design sort of meets a lot, a lot of needs. We've had those as Airbnbs. We've had them as um, full-time living. It's, it meets a lot of the different categories. That has been sort of our our favorite it's my favorite um there's a great video yeah. on the um front page of our website 
by a Canadian YouTuber who just walked in off the street one day and said, can I make you a video? I said, sure. Um, so yeah. worth, worth a watch. It's a non-biased video that we didn't even know. Yeah, was I saw before. it. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's our, that's our Banksy double loft. Yeah. Um, and then our Mount Nash design um, was sort of taken from the red gum. So we had a customer come along and say, we don't really want the staircase in that area can we move it to the front and then because the staircase was around the front it sort of dictated where a lot of other things were um and then we thought oh we like the design so we put it on the website when it gets to custom sort of in the 8.4 meter range we will do a little bit we won't do a lot just because we don't want to sell something that is overweight we want to make sure that everything is legal um, we give, a, as I mentioned before, we give an engineer certificate. We also give a, a way certificate, go away certificate. Um, you get your electrical, you get your plumbing, you get your gas. So you can pass that on to your insurance company if they ask for it. To answer that question of do we do custom? Yes, a little bit. But then when it comes to the 11 metre range, because of that, because we don't have the traditional problems of an electric trailer, we can pretty much within the dimensions of the trailer, do whatever you like. Um, obviously there's rules and regulations we still have to follow on locations of your door and gas regulations and all those sort of things still have to be followed, but it's opened up a whole, well, a whole lot of different opportunities for tiny home designs. Um, so some of those you'll see released over the next couple of weeks on social media. We're still, we're still finding our feet with the air brake sort of trailer, but yeah. we encourage people to come down and, and have a look at it in person, um, because it's a it's a big tiny home. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Another sort of thing that has has taken over because we do all our own steel framing in house, and we have our own roll former. DIY kits have become very popular, so that has become a, not a main part of the business, but it's become a larger part of the business. So you can get a trailer, under floor insulation, structural floor and frame assembled so all of your structure done um, completely custom any design you want we sit you can either sit down with us here or you can do a zoom call um, we've got a full-time architect and full-time engineer design it to how you want it we give you a 3d model a detailed frame group which it shows you like where every stud noggin window opening is and then complete it yourself and with the kits, you can have as much, you can have as little as you want or as much as you want. So we can supply you with your cladding, your windows, flooring, you know, your tiles, or we can just supply you with the frame. We can supply you just with the trailer. So it sort of gives people the flexibility. And at the end of the day, you're always going to save money doing it yourself. There's no rhyme argument about that. If you're putting your own labor in, um, you don't have a labor component, you're always going to save yourself money. At the same time, we do tell people that you should have a little bit of construction experience um, or know someone that does. Just just small things. You don't have to be a qualified builder. There's small tricks, tips and tricks, and you know, knowing how to use power tools and things like that is is important. In saying that, we've got some some teenagers at the moment that are that are giving it a red hot crack that are building their own tiny homes from Tassie to Queensland to Broome in WA. Um, oh, the wow. kids are going absolutely all over the place, <laughs> um, which is, yeah. That's amazing. Is, it's different. Yeah. We, don't, yes. we don't do so many lock-up stages. I know a lot of builders seem to do a lot of lock-ups. Um, the frame stage has been the most popular. An 8.4-metre frame is 29,900. So that's yeah, your trailer, your underfloor, um, your floor and your frame. We've also developed a uh, lightweight flooring alternative to standard yellow tongue and ply flooring. So it's only 2.9 kilograms per square meter versus yellow tongue that's around 12.7, 13. Oh, wow. uh, so it's a yeah. 10 kilo saving per square meter. So in a double yeah. loft tiny home, that's between... 280 to around 380 kilogram saving um wow. that can be put into yeah. yeah all sorts of other materials if you really want to or appliances yeah and in a, in a space like a tiny home that actually it makes a lot of difference because you're already in at those space and weight 
and height restrictions even in in some areas of the home too. So that's that's really interesting. And mm. um, I love hearing about the DIY side of things because I feel like uh, there's been this sort of shift in that too. I think what started out as very much a DIY movement, I think especially probably over in the US as well as Europe, but a bit here in Australia too, people like Fred uh, from Fred's Tiny Houses, maybe nine, 10 years ago, something, it was like this DIY movement. And then slowly, slowly over the years, you're starting to see more builders come on board. And then I think sort of every month or so you're hearing about more new builders and more new builders. And then it's like this big industry of it, which is, I think, in a way, it's also really great because it is a sign that there's demand. Um, every builder also has their own style and what they uh, uh, their experience and skills that they bring to the table and their unique aspects of what they bring to, and and then obviously location. And so, I think it just gives people so much, uh, so many more options. And uh, it's nice to see that you know the DIY is still sort of there, you know, alive mm, and, mm. and kicking there too for people that want to go down that path, and also maybe for people that do want to save a bit of money because yeah, like the look, the price of everything is going up, tiny homes included, but the price of everything when it comes to living uh, is is you know a big factor for a lot of people. Uh, and I'm just curious as well, just as you were talking, I was thinking about how you know we're talking about the different demographics of people, and you were talking about your models. Have you seen a shift or uh, anything that's different that's happened in terms of the demand for loft tiny homes versus ground floor tiny homes? Because I feel like back in the day, even just a few years ago, lofts were all the thing. And now there's actually seems to be, and it probably a, a reflection of the demographic too, of more ground level models coming on board. So what are, what are you guys seeing? Yeah, look, you, you, you're probably spot on there. There's definitely more single level houses. There's still a huge demand for loft houses. All yeah. of the houses we've currently, oh, except for one, all the houses we've currently got in the factory except for one are loft houses. So there's still a, there's still a huge demand for it. The, the single level, because because we're dealing with a certain um, floor space, like most of them around the 20 square metres, when you do have a sink, when you do have a ground floor bedroom, it does take up a large portion of the tiny home. Some people are fine with that, but the loft does really give you a lot of extra space. Like if you look at our, if you look at our red gum, our mountain ash, the living space is basically sacrificed if you had a downstairs bedroom. Our Banksia design, as I was saying earlier, how it can be used in so many different. Um, so many different uses so for so many different demographics. A lot of people have actually, even though it's a downstairs bedroom, some people have used it as offices, living space, cinema room, et cetera, mm. et cetera, um, and have upstairs as sleeping or vice versa. Yeah, to look, to answer your question, yeah, there, there's definitely single level um, has become more popular. Early or well, 2019 through to 21, Every single house we built was had a loft in it. Whether it was a storage loft mm. or a sleeping loft, it 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 had a it had a loft because yeah, it just it it uses the space. Just taking a quick break from the conversation to let you know, I'm now offering tiny house consulting. I get questions all the time about tiny house living and have lots to share from my own personal experiences of going through the design process of building a tiny, finding the right builder for me, living in a tiny home, as well as through speaking with guests on the show and beyond. So if you have questions about your specific situation and you want to dive deeper into where to start, preparing to transition into tiny living how to find a parking space for your home or talking through what some of the best options could be for you when it comes to creating your dream tiny life. Just know that I'm here for you. You can head over to tinyhouseconversations.com forward slash consult. I'd love to help you on your tiny journey. Now back to the show. Yeah. And I know for me, I, I, I have two lofts. One of them is a sleeping loft. And there is something really cozy and just different about, you know, get, I, I actually feel like it's the safe, it feels the safest and the most comfortable and cozy. And it just feels really nice to get into bed, you know, and, and there's a skylight and all, all, all that kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, I definitely feel like there's, there's people that 
still want that option. And as you say, you're able to, I mean, you could potentially have two separate bedrooms upstairs if you wanted to, if you're going to use that space as a loft as well as what you have in the home downstairs. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I'm curious about as well, off-grid solutions is, is obviously a big thing when it comes to tiny homes for some people. For other people, it might not be they that they want to just be on the grid or depending on what they've got accessible to them, where they're going to park their tiny. But what kind of off-grid solutions do you guys offer? Uh, yeah, so we've worked closely with our supplier to actually develop something that is custom to tiny houses so and custom to what appliances we offer. Uh, so when, when a customer comes to us and says, I want to be off-grid, um, we don't just say, yeah, this is what you, this is the one system we have. This yeah. is the price. Yeah. I ask them or our team asks them, what appliances are you actually going to run? Um, give us a list. Tell us are they gas or electric, et cetera. Do you have a budget? Because if you do have a budget around off grid, we can do things like make appliances LPG instead of electric, which brings the total power usage down, which allows for a smaller system. So we don't have a one size fits all. Uh, we've got three main systems, but we will change them accordingly to to what is being is being ran. Um, some people just really, really don't like gas. Some people are really, really happy with gas. There's that real, there's a bit of a stigma around LPG gas with down here in Victoria, they've changed the rules around natural gas. So all new houses can't be connected to natural gas. um, And a lot of people just don't want gas. So yeah, so we don't use any branded system. It's a completely custom made system, inverter, MPPT, you know, full roof of solar panels. Um, We get as many solar panels on the roof as we possibly can. We don't just go out with six solar panels. If it's an 8.4 metre house, we can get eight panels, eight-ish panels. It just depends if you've got things like a pop valley or a skylight, it reduces your amount of panels. To answer that question, it's completely dependent on what the customer's got. Um, we've We've done some massive systems with like 20 kilowatt hours of battery storage, seven seven KVA auto generators, you know, it's a 400 kilo generator, wow. 16 solar panels. Um, so we can go as big as you want or as small as you want. We can do super small, like two kilowatt inverters with like two Bosch AGM batteries. Yep. Back in, in 2019, we were, we were using a lithium battery that when it got below six degrees, it actually switched off. So we oh, switched wow. to AGMs for a while, and then um, there's now now most almost all not not everyone has built in um, heating system for lithium batteries, um, or at, le- at least if the battery doesn't do it, the inverter will regulate the temperature in the box because yeah, lithium batteries don't like the cold; um, they switch off to protect the battery. So we offer both AGM and lithium. Again, similar to gas and electric, some people love lithium, some people hate it. So there's options yeah. in, in both in both areas. Yeah, the AGM batteries, they have the similar lifespan, but the AGM batteries are a lot heavier. They charge a little slower. Um, lithium's a lighter, charge quicker. So there's there's alternatives for both. I love how you talked about it being a custom system because... That, that's another thing that I tend to see quite a lot were in tiny house Facebook groups, especially, or even just questions I get asked from the podcast and people will say, oh, what's the best solar system I should get? And it's really like, well, it's got to be unique to you because it's going to depend on, on what kind of appliances you have, how you're actually using your tiny home. You're going to be there full time. How many people are there? Are you going to be there part time? Um, yeah. Are most of the appliances you're using, like, are they do they use a lot of power? You know, are you having an air conditioner? Are you using an oven? Are you using a stove? Just all these different things. That and, and and then how are you using it and how often? So because I know for me when I was sort of doing this whole solar research on tiny homes and thinking about well, what's the best option for me because, you know, you can put them on the roof like what you're talking about, but there's also solar trailers. There's also like a skybox, which I'm sure you're aware of down in Victoria too, and just different systems you can have depending on, you know, what people need and maybe where their tiny house is positioned. Are they going to be in a shady area or, or in which case they're going to maybe need 
it might be better suited to have something that is a bit further away from the home that can sit in, yeah. um, you know, a more sunny part and stuff like that. So I think there's just so many things that go into choosing the right solar for your situation. I'm curious though, do you guys do like if someone did want to do um, solar trailers or, or something else that's not with uh, panels on the roof, do you do options like that too? We do. We have, we have solar trailers um, again, same yeah. as whether it's on the, whether it's on the house or it's on the solar trailer, it's completely custom. The only thing with the solar yeah. trailer is we can only fit six panels on there. You do have the ability to have a ground-mounted um, array of panels as well. So if you, yeah, know, awesome. you know you're going to be stationary for a while and have the solar trailer, you can add like another six panels. It's just plug and play. We yeah. just had a solar trailer come back to us yesterday. Unfortunately, um, in the flooding, it washed down the river and yay. <gasps> so, look, water rose so quickly they didn't get a chance to to move it. But in most situations, the beauty of a solar trailer is you could actually move it out of the way if you were in affected areas. And same with bushfire. We did some in, um, when were the bushfires bad? Was that 21, the bushfires, I think? We did some to... I think it was 21. Yeah. Or was yeah, it 2019? It could have been. Yeah, it could have been. Yeah. Down um, we, here it was 2019, but, yeah, it could yeah. have been elsewhere. So yeah. we did a bunch of solar trailers to farmers um, around the fire-affected areas then just because they didn't yeah. have any power for, for months because it took so long because all the yeah. power poles burnt down. The solar trailer, similar to a tiny home, has got several, several different uses, um, whether it's yeah. emergency relief or individual power supply or the beauty of some of our larger solar trailers is they can power multiple tiny homes off one trailer so instead of having mm. three different off-grid systems on three different houses three sets of batteries three sets of inverters three sets of solar panels you have one trailer and you've just got to make sure that you know the dis the cable you're running between the tiny homes is the correct is correct or you get voltage lo loss over a certain distance but if those tiny homes are all within a certain distance and you're using the right cable for those distances, um, you can save yourself a lot of money and and a lot of potential headaches as well. It's really great. And the fact that they're portable too and, you know, you can also tow them just on like a – I think that they can be towed on two wheels yeah, but yeah, definitely yeah, four yeah. wheels. Most yeah, yeah. under 750 sure. kilos. So under 750 yeah. kilos you don't need any brakes. So pretty much every single car with a tow ball can, can – legally tow yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Uh, and I'm curious, Riley, as we're sort of talking today, you know, and I've speak to many different tiny house builders and everyone sort of has come to this space from a different, in a different way, whether it's what you shared at the start of you sort of fell into it by accident and, and, you know, you didn't intend to it when then other people are, you know, they've been builders for a long time and maybe building, you know, residential or commercial or whatever it might be and then crossed over into tiny homes and, you know, just speaking to all those different people, everyone's doing it for a different purpose or what's driving them and what's behind all of that. And often it's more than just building a tiny home for someone, it's more than just providing this structure. I'm curious for you and what you guys do at Treehab, like what is the best thing for you about building a tiny home for someone and why do you do what you do in the in the bigger picture of things? Yeah, well, um, I've always sort of sort of lived by like if you enjoy what you do, you never work a day in your life sort of thing. Yeah. It sounds quite ironic, but a bit cliche, you could say. But <laughs> I truly do like don't treat it as a job. I work all the time. And um, I just like seeing things go from, I've always liked building things, um, whether what, whatever it was. So seeing something go from a pile of material to a complete home, um, there's something about that. I just, yeah, I can't really describe it. I really like it. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, um, and we've satisfying. Built, it is so satisfying. <laughs> I don't even know how many tiny homes we've built now. I'd have to work it out exactly, but it'd be well into the hundreds or well over a hundred. Yeah. Um, I don't think we would be near 200 yet, but it over 100 and and all the different, you know, things that you can fit into a little house. It's got everything that a 150 plus square meter house has got, but in 20 square meters. So quite often uh, the kitchens are the same size. The bathrooms are the same size as one normal residential bathroom. So when you're in there, it's it's a home for, for so many people. So yeah, it's 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 a hard question to answer. Why why I really, yeah, I just do. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair enough for sure. And everyone's different and there's no right or wrong answer at all. And I agree with you. There's something really amazing. And I spoke about this on the, in another interview recently. And just for me of my own personal experience of having a tiny built or designed built and sort of seeing that process go from an idea to then a design to then a build to then it being delivered on site to then moving in and then to like living in it and over a year and just that whole process from start to finish and sort of how I don't know how it's all just unfolded into something really amazing right and you would get to see that from time and time again for for different people and building, as you say, like over 100 tiny homes now. Uh, and, you know, if people are sort of liking what they're hearing today and they want to, uh, well, actually, before I ask that, mm-hmm. you guys deliver around the country and do you also have finance options for people as well? Yeah, we do. We have a couple of finance yeah. companies we work with. Um, so that can be applied through our website or contact us yeah. directly and we can give you some other options as as simple as reach out over email or or a phone call and we go from there. If you're not local, if you're interstate, we can do a Zoom walkthrough. That's no problem at all. We do like people to come if they can um, and get a feel and be be involved as much as they can throughout the build as well. I try to be on the phone to people at least once every two days to try and try and keep them updated and, and, and come here. There's no amount of times we don't say you can only come five times during the build, come as much <laughs> as you want because it's, it's, it's a big investment. Um, it's yes. something that has to be right. It can't be rushed. It, it's, it's a lot of people buy a tiny home and that's, that's, they see themselves in that tiny home for the rest of their life. So, and the small things count. So, yeah. So reach out, come and e- email, phone call, and come and have a look and see what we've got to offer. Yeah, amazing. And so people can also, so they can chat to you along the process. Uh, mm-hmm. You obviously do like a design meeting and all of that and de- and then do progress photos and things along the way too of like each stage of the build and people can, and as you say, like maybe do video calls and they can and see where things are at too. Lots of builders do things very differently, but is it, you pay a deposit to get on the building schedule and then you're sort of paying um, it off in stages of the build being complete and that too? Is that how that works? Yeah, so it's a 10% deposit um, of the yeah. quoted amount and then uh, four even payments across the bill yeah. once it starts. We do things slightly different to how a normal builder would do it. By the time the trailer is complete, an 8.4 metre build is finished and complete in around three to four weeks. Um, so wow. things happen quite quickly. That That's with a standard design. That's not with anything custom. Because it's a standard design, all of our cutout lists are already done. Our frame um, drawings are already done. The engineering's already done. All those items are, are, are it, it's pretty much pressing a button. The, the guys know that the guys in the factory too have got to know the design. So there's less checking plans, you could say. Once it starts, it happens very quickly, but there are four payments across the build. We're looking to change that to three just because I don't like sending a payment and then the two days later, the, that's the next payment. Going back to the steel framing, the beauty of steel framing is um, we can have a whole house framed in under an hour. So by the time the trailer is complete, it's not uncommon for the frame stage to be completed under floor insulation, under floor insulation, by the way, is standard in all of our builds. So we've found that air circulation under the trailer just cools that floor really quickly, um, especially down here in Victoria where it's freezing 364 days out of 365. <laughs> um, we had our hottest day yesterday, actually. It was 30, reached 39 degrees here yesterday. Um, oh, wow. Uh, That's yeah. hot. Yeah. Similar yeah. here too. Yeah. yeah. Now now it's raining today outside. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> Can't pick it. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, so underfloor, structural floor and um, frame can be done in as little as a, an hour to an hour and a half. Um, yeah, so that that's really, really quick. speeds up the build process. Uh, and not, a, not only is, is, it, is it quicker, it's straighter too. So there's no straightening of walls required because steel is absolutely dead straight when it comes out of the roll former. It's 100% Australian steel, blue scope. Um, it's got that all the homes have a 50 year structural warranty. So they are built solid. They are built to last. They're built for Australian conditions. 
at the moment we run off about a three to four month process to delivery. So by the time the the deposit's paid, expect the house at your gate um, in three to four months. That does vary. We are building more display options or stock, you could call it, so that people don't have to wait. There's been a couple of situations over the last 12 months where people have actually been living in their car um, and need a solution ASAP. So we'll have that option available. Um, We're also opening up display centres in a lot of states around the country. Uh, They'll be announced over the next couple of weeks. Um, Yeah, so that... Uh, our customers don't just have to go on Zoom and do a Zoom consultation. They will actually be able to see tiny homes, our tiny homes in person locally around the country. So by the end of the year, we're hoping to be in at least three or four other states. Yeah, it'll be um, it'll be exciting, something different. Yeah, that's really exciting. I think it's a smart thing too because I know for me, and probably most people, if not everyone, there's something about actually standing inside and seeing it in person and and imagining yourself, can I actually live in this space as opposed to just seeing something online, which is obviously a good option to have if you can't really access somewhere local to you. But I think that's going to be amazing because, yeah, it does sort of bring I think what could be an idea and uh, and lots of questions about something sort of bringing it to life and, and showing people, you know, is this somewhere that I can actually see myself living or my family and, and, and even just like envisioning, you know, how they would lay their own home out and what it could look like and where everything's going to go. So I think that's, that's really exciting. And uh, where's the best place that people can come and connect with you online? Yep, yeah, um, Instagram is best, uh, Instagram and Facebook. And otherwise, just send us an email um, and we'll get back to you hopefully within 24 hours with yeah. a lot more information. Yeah. And it's treehab.com.au? It is. Yeah, treehab.com.au. Yeah, yeah beautiful. Well, Riley, uh, just before, um, you know, we wrap up the show, is there anything else that you feel like we haven't covered about what you guys do uh, or, or anything around tiny houses that you feel is important to share and leave everyone with? No, look, I think we've covered everything in, in important. Yeah, as I said, if you have any questions or want to reach out, just shoot us an email or phone call. Awesome. We'll put a link in the show notes at tinyhouseconversations.com if they want to come and check you out on Instagram and Facebook and your website as well. And I just want to say thank you so much for your time today, Riley. It's been really great to get to know a bit more about you and what Treehab are doing. And thank you for what you're doing for the tiny house space and, you know, for helping out during this challenging time with, with housing. And yeah, thank you again for being here. Likewise. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And if you're listening to us at home, thank you so much for being here. Make sure you go check out everything that Riley and Tree Hab are doing. Again, those uh, links will be at tinyhouseconversations.com. And stay tuned every Thursday for new episodes of the podcast. See you next week. Thanks again for listening. And if you enjoyed the conversation today, you found it valuable and you want to support the podcast, the best way you can do that is to share the love. That way I can keep bringing you more tiny house conversations to help you on your own tiny journey. So here are three ways that you can support the podcast. Number one, if you have a friend or family member that you feel would benefit from hearing these conversations, feel free to share it with them, email them, text them, send them a telegram, do whatever you need to do to share it with them. Number two, if you hit the subscribe button, you'll know exactly when the next episode is live. And number three, if you head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to podcasts and leave a five-star rating and review. Thank you so much in advance. I appreciate you and I'll see you in the next episode.